In this video, we will go over 802.1x authentication using 40 gate, 40 switch. And then my choice of radius server here is going to be a Windows uh, server with, with NPS installed. All right, so the goal here is so that this laptop or this machine is not able to access uh, the network. It'll get blocked at the switch port until the laptop successfully authenticates to pretty much the radius server here, right? So after it successfully authenticates, then the switch port will grant access to the 192.168.111 network. Uh, now, one caveat that we're going to be considering while we're configuring the, the 48 firewall is that the switch is actually on the 192.168.120 network. That's the DHCP IP address that it gets from the 40 gate. So the switch does have to have a firewall policy so that the 192.168.120 network or the, the actual switch management interface itself must be able to access the 192.168.111 network um, all, at all times so that it can actually send its radius requests from the 120 network through the FortiGate back down to the radius server who is also on the 192.168.111 network. I think it'll all come clear while we're configuring it, but just, just a heads up as to uh, you know the logic behind that. All right, starting on the communication between the FortiGate and the NPS server. So you know I have a radius client with the FortiGate and then I have a shared secret. So now if I go back to the FortiGate's configuration, I can go to uh, user and authentication, radius server. Let's create a new radius server called uh, let's just call it Windows NPS. Um, you know, this is the IP address of the Windows server. I'm putting in the shared secret. And then let's hit OK. OK, so there, you know, when I do the test connectivity, the shared secret is successful. So the radius connection is up. Now, with regards to the switch, if I go to manage 40 switches, we can see this is going to be the switch that's going to be, you know, the laptop is connected to this switch. If I double click on that switch, we can see that it's on this network 192.168.120.3. So I do need to allow, I need to have a firewall policy that allows the 40 link interface to communicate with the production interface um, where the radius server resides. So let's configure that. All right, so here's the policy that I created via the CLI. I had to create it via the CLI because you can only specify, at least in this firmware 7.0.6, to specify the source interface being 40 link, uh, the only way to do it is selecting it via the CLI. So I have the source interface as the 40 link, which is the 192.168.120 network. Destination interface is prod, which is 192.168.111.0 network. And then the source address is going to be all. The destination address is just the IP address of the radius server. So then when we look at the GUI, it will create it in the GUI afterwards, but then the initial creation must be via the CLI when you specify the 40 link source interface. So this is what it looks like via the GUI. I just created it 40 link to radius. And there's this, the same configuration from the CLI, but via uh, the web UI. All right, back to our radius server. Um, on the Windows side, I have a group named test group one. And the member of that test group is test user one to test user three. And then on my radius client configuration, if I go down to um, the network policies, I have a policy named NPS one. And that policy has a condition for the Windows group to be test underscore group underscore one. So pretty much any user um, you know, that authenticates to that FortiGate radius client is is applicable to be hitting this NPS one policy. So back to the 40 gate, let's just quickly test to make sure that that part of it works just between the the 40 gate and the radius server. So if I go Windows NPS, we'll edit that. So the shared secret works. That's what the, why this says successful. But then if I go test user credentials, let's make sure that that test user with which is within that test group one can successfully authenticate. Okay, perfect. So we're good from that perspective. All right, and next step, we have to go to user and authentication, user groups. We're going to create a new group. Let's call this Windows uh, NPS group. And then we're going to add a remote group, which is going to reference that Windows radius server, which was named Windows NPS. We're just going to select the, the group filter to be any. Okay, so now we have our group created. 
Now it will navigate to Wi-Fi and switch controller, and then it will be 40 switch port policies. There is a default configuration in here. Let's just make a brand new one though. Let's call this 802, you know, 1X, um, you know, Windows NPS. It's gonna be a port based and we'll go Windows NPS group. That's the group that we just created a moment ago. And let's just settle with that for now. Next step, we need to go to our 40 switch ports that we want to enforce the security policy on. So in my case, let's use port 10. So, you know, first thing we need to do is we need to add another column at the top, which will be the security policy. And let's apply that. And then we'll scroll over to the far right specific to port 10. And we notice that there's no security profile enabled and that's a default config. So we'll go 802.1x Windows NPS, and let's apply that. So we're complete here from the FortiGate configuration perspective. Now, from the FortiGate too, we can we can gather some some diagnostic information about that switch port. So if we type in this command diag switch controller switch info 802.1x from the FortiGate, we can gain visibility to the switch and see what state the you know the the ports that have the policy associated to it is in. So. For example, when I put in that command, since port 10 on this switch is the only one that has the, the security policy associated with it, we can see just information about that one port. So the port is in the state of unauthorized. Um, you know, the VLAN that it will be associated to, assuming that the authentication is successful, will be VLAN 100. And then about the session, we can see that the state is in authenticating. All right, so now we are on the client or you know what it's called in this environment in this 802.1x environment would be the supplicant, right? So, you know, there are some pre-configurations that we have to have to the machine before it can, you know, before it's actually going to be able to attempt to communicate with the switch over, you know, the 802.1x protocol, right? So, you know, we need to make sure in our services, so if we go to our services wired auto config, I believe that needs to be enabled um, you know, the actual interface that we're connecting to. So um, let's just take a look at the properties. So we might need to have certain configurations on them. Your, yours might be different. I'm just trying to get something to work. Um, so then, you know, under authentication, I have, you know, IEEE 802.1x authentication enabled. Um, you know, in the settings, you, you can check or uncheck this, like, you know, play around with it in your environment to, to get these settings to work, but this is currently working for me. Um, you know, if I click that configure option, I've unchecked automatically use my Windows login name and password. And then, you know, if I look in these additional settings, I have specify authentication mode as user or computer authentication, right? You might have to play around with these settings. These are very Windows based settings, but at the end of the day, just Make sure that your your supplicant is working, or your your um, in my case, I'm using a Windows client. And then you, you know, once those settings are correct, then if all thing is all things are working, you should get an option here that says attempting to authenticate when you do connect, um, you know, physically connect up to the 40 switch switch port. In my case, it's switch port number 10. So we can see here, I actually got this authentication prompt here. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to type in that testing user, test user one. I'm typing in the correct credentials. All right, and the credentials are not working. So let's go to the FortiGate. We're going to, you know, just start a packet capture here, and then let's run another test. All right, so we can see pretty quickly here based on the test that, you know, the access request is going to uh, the server, but then the server is not responding at all. So now let's let's just go over why that's happening. So up until now, we've been using the the FortiGate's built-in uh, radius configuration and and test tool to be able to check that the communication between you know the FortiGate and the radius server is, is all good and that the user authentication is successful. I and and the reason why I added this step in um, is because you know I just find that it is valuable because we can just use it as a test tool, almost as a you know a base environment to be able to make sure that the authentication is working. But then when we're actually proceeding with making that configuration and applying it to the 802.1x policy, things change a little bit in the background because what happens is the FortiGate is sending configuration. It's sending pretty much the exact same configuration for the radius server down to the 40 switch. 
but then now the actual source of the traffic is from the 40 switch and not the 40 gate. Uh, so then what we actually have for communication is, you know, traffic goes from the 40 switch through the 40 gate, through the 40 gates policy, and then to, um, and then to the, the, the radius server. So what we have to do now is actually create another radius configuration on, um, on our NPS server. As a next step, let's go to the main NPS screen. Um, the option that we'll select here is radius server for 802.1x wireless or wired connections. And then let's configure it. Um, we're using wired ethernet, so let's do that one here. Uh, you know, 40 switch wired ethernet, I guess that's what we'll name it. And then we'll specify that the radius client associated with this configuration will be switch one. And then we'll use Microsoft protected EAP. And then let's add the group to be test, I think it was test group one. Okay. Okay, let's finish that config. All right, so let's just take a look at what that what that wizard just created. So I believe what it created is it creates, so we already had the radius client configured, and then we also had a connection request policy that got created. So that is the 40 switch wired ethernet, that's the name. And then, you know, the condition is NAS port type. And then it also created a network policy named 40 switch wireless ethernet as well. And that's where our group is defined and uh, the condition NAS port type is defined as well. All right, so as a final step, let's go back to that, um, that Windows device again. Okay, so we got the prompt here, test user one, put in the password. Let's see if it works this time. All right, and it looks like this time things are successful. And, you know, let's just run IP config. Okay, so our device is on the network. Now on the 40 gate, it shows that the state is authenticated for that device. And lastly here, when we do look at, uh, you know, an updated packet capture, we can see that after a while, then there's actual bi-directional communication. And that's because of the extra configuration that we added there. So just to step back and kind of reiterate what I was mentioning before about which clients are required and which are not, I suppose that technically, yeah, we, we wouldn't actually even need this 40 gate one enabled, um, you know, and then as part of that, if I were accessing the 40 gate and I went to user and authentication, radius servers, this NPS configuration, you know, it, it's not going to work, right? Uh, so even, even though this doesn't work, our other configuration you know, it will still work. Our NPS will still work from that Windows machine. There we go, right? If we replaced that laptop, or, in, you know, in my case, just I was just using a Windows machine that had, you know, um, 802.1x supplicant configuration on it. Um, I just replaced that with a dumb device like a printer or you know, maybe certain uh, VoIP phones or, you know, really, you know, maybe an IoT device. But, um, you know, how do we still provide some type of authentication without access, allowing somebody to just access the network by plugging into a switch port? Well, we can do that to a degree by using Mac authentication bypass. So let's say that we have a list of devices that, you know, are, are pre-configured on the radius server and then the switch you know, we'll, we'll check those MAC addresses against that server. So in, in certain cases, maybe you can just bypass that username and password authentication. Obviously, nothing is as good as that username and password, but this could be an alternative. So the 40 gate configuration is fairly easy here since we've already set up the majority of it. We can just go back into our port policy, um, and then we're just going to enable MAC authentication bypass. Now everything else is up to the server. Now, just to show you guys what's happening here, let's let's start by just running a packet capture. Before I've done any configuration on the server, let's just see the communication that's happening uh, between pretty much the switch and the server, but it's all generated from the device that is connected to that switch port, right? Because the MAC authentication bypasses has been set, there's actually going to be, you know, even though the printer is connected up, there's just going to be requests being sent all the time for that one, for that um, the MAC address, right? So if we look at the radius protocol here, 
There we go. We can see we can see that the, the username field has the following value, which is the MAC address of the printer. And all we're seeing is a request followed by a reject, followed by a request. Like this will probably just continue happening forever, right? All right, so in NPS, let's create what's called here a, uh, a connection request policy. So we'll create new. Um, we'll go, you know, MAB policy next. So we're going to specify the calling station ID for the radius client properties. And then we'll put in the MAC address of the printer. We select accept users without validating credentials. And I believe that should be all that we need here. And then we're gonna wanna bring that up to the top as we don't want any of the other authentication policies to be matched first. All right, as soon as I added that configuration, now we can see that in response to the access request, which has the calling station ID, that's where the, the MAC address actually is. So it's not the username like I mentioned before. I do believe it's this calling station ID that's getting checked on uh, the radius server. And then we see the access accept, right? And then when we look at the FortiGate configuration as well, and we run that command, Diag switch controller switch info 802.1x. Now we actually see that using Mac authentication bypass, the state is authenticated. Now, once more as a final sanity test, I'm going to I unplugged the printer, plugged in the um, plugged back in the, the laptop again. And as you can see, I do have to authenticate, right? So the Mac authentication bypass only applies to the printer there. All right, and there we have it. So we have user and password authentication via 802.1x as well as Mac authentication bypass. So, you know, hope this helped and uh, I guess we'll see you guys in the next video.